Hello and welcome to Portfolio Matters Weekly Markets Checklist Week 150. Yes, we've done 150 of these now. But before we get into it, Richard will read the disclaimer. Thank you, Keith. Everything discussed during the Portfolio Matters podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be considered as investment advice. Listeners should be aware that we will be discussing securities that we own or have a financial interest in. Please do your own research or consult a professional investment advisor before making any decisions regarding topics mentioned on the show. A full disclaimer can be found at the end. What do we have this week, Keith? Okay, lots of news this week. First of all, it was the UK budget. We have a section on that coming up. Also, OPEC Plus met and agreed to extend its output cuts of 2.2 million barrels a day into Q2 2024, so an extra quarter. Saudi will extend its voluntary production cuts of a million barrels, and Russia committed to cutting its production by an extra 471,000 barrels a day in Q2. Now, we'll show you the data in a minute that Russia doesn't seem to have cut at all. So the credibility of that uh, commitment is very much open to question. EU has imposed a 1.8 billion euro fine on Apple for stifling competition on its app store for alternative music streaming services. And I think that the regulatory environment for these big tech firms may be turning against them. And then we've had a couple of speeches from central bank governors this week. So the Fed governor, Waller, hinted at a return of Operation Twist, or that's what the market took it as, saying that the Fed needed greater control over the yield curve, and that led to a rally in Treasuries and in gold. Jay Powell gave what the markets considered a dovish speech, talking about the need for rate cuts later in the year, and Christine Lagarde talked about how the ECB was on track for first rate cuts in June. So all of that led to market expectations that interest rates would start to come down later in the year and led to a general risk on rally across markets. Now, talking about OPEC, so this is a chart from the FT showing the agreed OPEC plus cuts. And you can see that actually the agreed cuts are over 5 million barrels a day leading to the question, how long can the OPEC plus sustain these cuts and potentially all this lost revenue? But then when you look at actually what they've done, there's not very much evidence of much cutting at all. So the thick, dark blue line is 2024. And yes, it's down on last year, but not really by very much. So if you exclude Saudi Arabia... OPEC production is pretty much at its highs. Saudi has certainly cut. So Saudi is sitting on at least 2 million barrels a day of spare capacity, possibly more. Russia, which has committed to cut, frankly, there is no evidence it's cut at all. And so its latest promise, they will cut 471,000 barrels a day in Q2, should be treated with a great deal of scepticism. Now, meanwhile, in the Middle East, after a bulk carrier was sunk last week by the Houthi rebels, another bulk carrier was hit yesterday and has been abandoned and is drifting. So tensions in the Middle East are still running high, and that is good for the oil price. In the US... This is the latest opinion polls, and frankly, based on the opinion polls, it looks like we could have Trump as president again. Be prepared. And we're back in a risk-on environment. Everything is bubbling up. This is Dogecoin. And we'll show you the charts in a minute. Actually, gold is even better than this. Gold had a great week, up over 5%. Richard will be happy. And part of the reason 
everything is up is that everything is denominated in dollars and dollar fell after dovish comments from Jerome Powell. Now, a few weeks ago, we talked about the dangers to Egypt of the closure of the Suez Canal and how it is ringed by countries in conflict. And it obviously had its own revolution as part of the Arab Spring. Well, this week, Egypt devalued the pound by 34% and raised interest rates by 6% to 27.75%. Egypt has problems. <clears throat> and destabilized Egypt would cause further <clears throat> problems in the Middle East. And on to the UK budget, Richard. Thanks, Keith. So the big headline, uh, someone described it as a rabbit that was released several days ago in Parliament and was hopping around chewing the carpet. Um, <laughs> rabbit out of the hat. Um, uh, a national insurance cut by 2p, costing £10 billion pounds a, a year. Um, abolition of non-DOM status, which I see in the FT, is causing uproar amongst the uh, non-DOMs. Um, I don't know what, what impact it'll have on the UK economy, but I suspect probably not good, actually. So, um, can I just come in there? Because I mean, the thing is, they have a, a when they say they abolish non DOM status, they've given non DOMs four years of non DOM status. It's only after that. Okay. So, I mean, it seems perfectly reasonable to me, frankly. Thank you, Keith. Yeah. Uh, child benefit income threshold raised from 50,000 to 60,000, and British. ISA to be created, which will allow £5,000 to be invested in UK equities only, in addition to the 20k existing ISA allowance, which can be also invested in overseas equities, trying to get the equity in UK stock market up. And a windfall oil levy is going to be extended to uh, by year to 2029. Yeah. Um, I mean, uh, the um, I just looked at um, if you earn between something like Fifty-five thousand pounds and one hundred thirty thousand pounds a year, i.e., almost the entirety of the middle classes. Mm. Um, you're significantly worse off uh, after this budget than you would have been before it, because mm. of the. I believe it's because of the freezing of personal yes. hours. I yeah. mean, the whole thing is just a farce. It's smoke and mirrors. And Jeremy Hunt is doing to the economy what he so successfully did to the NHS. So the OBR is forecast. The UK inflation will return to target. With Within months to stay there. All I would say to that is, we know what economists' inflation forecasts are like. <laughs> don't believe it, guys. Don't, yes, very, don't believe it. Yes, very. We should see what happens. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But I thought it was interesting that, you know, that this on your point, the inflation forecasts have been revised incredibly strongly over the last, you know, six months, and now they're talking about inflation coming back to and under the two percent target within a few months and then staying there. Yeah, and you know, they may be right, but I just think that these forecasts have proven in the past to be so appallingly bad. Yeah. Um, and obviously they have taken some feedback and I know the Bank of England is doing a, a study to work out why they got it so seriously wrong. Yeah. Um, so they may get better, but um so the OBR is expecting immigration to be higher. Um I mean what I think one of the issues with immigration net immigration last year was 750,000 and if you assume that four people could live in a dwelling unit, mm. then that requires the UK to be building 100,000 dwelling units for net immigration. Yeah. Never mind the already homeless people and the people who are really struggling to find someone on the housing ladder. And so the current system is basically fighting itself. Yeah. And this government has signally failed to address any of the issues. Never mind one mm. of them. It's failed to address any of the issues. Yeah. yeah, so you know we are we are going down a unfortunately we're going down a route where nothing is nothing is connecting to anything else in any sensible way. Well, I in the case of immigration, you're absolutely right. I mean, seven hundred thousand people we need to build. We're failing to meet existing home building targets, and you know we need now need to build a hell of a lot more. Sorry about that, but I just feel that you know we are. As a country, we just need to be, you know, we are not being well governed and we haven't been well governed for a long time. Interestingly, this is a bit of a side, but you see the, the, the um, Department of, I don't know, the Insolvency Service looking to get green sales struck off as being a company direct for 15 years. David Cameron, however, 
has been promoted to the House of Lords. <laughs> yes. <laughs> this is the participation rate, which shows that uh, the November 2023 forecast is sub substantially higher than the actual, uh, than, well, substantially higher than the current forecast. So something's, what's going on here, Keith? Well, a lot of people um, have left the labour force in part because of long-term sickness post-COVID and they're not coming back. And so, you know, the reality is, Richard, those immigration numbers are actually very good for the economy compared to, you know, yeah. we're, we've lost a lot of people from the workforce. So the, this economy is being propped up by immigration, whether we like it or not. Well, it is, it is, Keith. I mean, there's another point of view, isn't there, which which would be, you know, the sort of reductio ad absurdam, ad absurdam argument, which would be if there were no immigration, yeah, no, what would the consequence be on the economy? Now, there's some areas where skilled staff wouldn't be available and that would need to be addressed. But, of course, what would actually happen is a lot of services that we currently get very cheaply would be more expensive yeah. because pay rates would have to be higher. If pay rates were higher, well, one presumes participation rate would be higher. So mm. I sort of wonder whether we are, in fact, in a self-reinforcing cycle moving in, in the wrong direction. And but what we actually need to do is to say we have you know, clearly then if pay rates go higher. We have then an inflation problem you know, in the yeah. commerce. But actually, do we need to reset the economy at to a level at which people, indigenous, not indigenous, people are living in the UK are able to earn a wage which it enables them to live in the manner which we think they should people should be able to live i.e to afford a property to afford to be able to pay the rent mm -hmm. not to have to live sort of three in a bedroom and stuff like that and actually we're heading down an accelerating uh, accelerating rate down a path which which is making the problem worse not better well i think a lot of the problems come from uh, property so you know rents and housing costs now just yeah. Uh, consume a vast proportion of people's wages. If we could get house house prices down and rents down, yeah. then we would uh, tackle a lot of those problems in one go. The trouble is, we no government has uh, managed to solve that issue. Yeah, no, I agree with that, Keith. Anyway, this is not showing you know a healthy economy, is it? With participation no. rate falling. Um, and an OBR is forecast the UK grows 0.8% in 2024, long term growth of 1.6%. Um, I was on a side, by the way, just yeah. a quick mention of inflation forecasting. Of course, inflation forecasting doesn't include taxation, does it? And if you live in Birmingham, where you're getting a 20% rise in council tax, does that go mm. into your inflation numbers? Yeah. Uh, no, it doesn't. <laughs> no. But um, I found this this number pretty shocking, actually. So long-term growth of 1.7% per annum, that's really poor. It is, you know, given where we are with government debt, mm -hmm. what we actually need is long-term growth of 4 or 5% per annum. We do. Uh, to try and rectify this situation because this, this is sort of struggling along. Yeah. You know, this is almost within the error bars of the inflation rate, frankly. So actually, so Keith and I are standing at the next general election. <laughs> yes, the monster raving loony party. <laughs> um, so lower interest expenses have allowed the Chancellor to fund tax cuts. They so obviously with interest rates falling back a bit, um, there's a little bit spare in the cupboard, which is not quite. So uh, this chart shows the um, yeah. how it's all going to be sort of uh, allocated out over the next few years. Well, I think the main point, Richard, is that, you know, so low interest rates have given him some extra money and he immediately spends it all. There's an asymmetry here. Whenever you know, interest rates or things go in the favour of the chance that he spends it, when it goes against him, he doesn't cut back. Public sector borrowing is expected to come under control in coming years. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Is it yeah. indeed? And the national debt should stabilise. Well, Johnny will hope so. Mm. So there has been a significant redistribution, hasn't there, Keith? Look yeah. at this chart. From the top 15 to the bottom 85%. Yeah, yeah. you not actually what you'd expect from a Conservative government, but they have been, you know, the, over the course of this parliament, there's been a lot of net redistribution. Mm. 
it hasn't brought them much popularity. No, well, of course, it hasn't. You know, the rest of the economy has been so badly managed that the net redistribution probably doesn't really feature in people's um, thinking. You know, mm. they don't feel better off. Yeah. So pensioners will be the most heavily hit in the coming years because of this freezing of uh, tax thresholds and um, a cutting of national insurance, which clearly um, doesn't benefit pensioners. I wonder if that's why they did it. They didn't want to do the trip address the triple lock. Yeah, I agree. I don't think I don't disagree with this. Actually, I don't see why workers should be penalised more than you know pensioners or no, I agree. Who don't work like me. I think you know you work very hard, Keith. Yeah, to very little gain at the moment, mate. But anyway, yeah. I mean, I agree. The triple lock was another Cameronian disaster, wasn't it? Yeah. Apologies yes. to all pensioners out there. And then that we, as we know, the freezing of these tax thresholds is dragging more and more people into higher tax brackets in coming years. And uh, it is a sort of sneaky, nasty, snide way of um, yeah addressing these things. But then you know, I guess it speaks to the personalities involved, possibly. <laughs> and the total tax burden in the UK um, is the highest it's been post-war. And because we have got all of these tax rises coming through in the future. Yeah. Oh, isn't that nice? So the OPR has been steadily downgrading UK growth forecasts. Have they got it right yet, Keith? That's the question. Well, it's pretty shock. I found this pretty shocking. The the extent of the downgrades. Yeah. yeah and so that... 2029, it, it, growth will have been approximately half what they yeah. originally predicted. Precisely, and that is despite you know huge net immigration, which should boost growth. Yeah. And of course, this is GDP growth per capita, which I, I think fundamentally is the key thing because that's that's yes, the wealth yeah. of individuals, the wealth of um, true, and uh, it's too low. It's much too low. Yeah. So we've got a good. Have we got an ugly slide mm. <laughs> coming up? So the, the, the summary: the good, the bad, and the ugly. Um, I think Keith just got his categories wrong here. We've got so the good Jeremy Hunt has learnt from Liz Truss and flagged all the major policy initiatives well in advance. So the guilt market was unaffected. And that national insurance will help working people as long as they don't actually move into the higher rate tax bracket in the future. And UK living standards are forced, forecast to return to growth, <laughs> somewhat <laughs> measly growth, or one yeah. has to say. And the bad, of course, is that uh, we have this huge rising tax burden in future years. Yeah. And uh, the growth is is pathetic. Yeah. Now, you're talking about the ugly, Richard. <laughs> I, th I thought the similarity between the two was uncanny. Have they ever been seen in the same room? They haven't, have they? Also, is it is it Wallace in Wallace and Gromit? Oh, yes, that's true, actually. But Gromit's got bigger ears. No, Wallace has got big wheels. <laughs> yes. And on to this week's economic data. So, summary, the UK economy is weak but showing signs of bottoming, and as, as is the EU. The US is strong, but actually we had been expecting the US economy to strengthen further, and all the latest data is surprisingly weak. Non-farm payrolls are out later today. China, difficult to tell, but likely weak. OK, and on to the UK. So we had the revised S&P Global Manufacturing PMI, and that was revised up, but still in recession. The service was interesting. It was actually revised down. So we had been expecting the UK economy to be strengthening again and actually that has stalled a bit in february so the composite as a result strengthened slightly but less than the initial estimates the construction pmi showed surprising strength and is almost back to neutral so that's a big rise in february and that has been led by the house builders who are feeling more optimistic now, the interest rates appear to have peaked. The 
retail sales, the British Retail Consortium Retail Sales Monitor, disappointed in February, coming in at 1% year on year. And that was well below the rate of inflation and sales in non-food items actually declined by 2.5% in the three months to February. Not good. The UK consumer is not feeling wealthy and not spending. Hallie's Facts House Prices Reminder, this is the index of the value of houses on which Halifax writes mortgages. So there will be some bias here, but growth slowed to 0.4%, well below expectations in February. So house prices are rising, but the rate of growth appears to have slowed and they were up 1.7% year on year. Citigroup Economic Surprise Index eased. So UK economic data is still surprising to the downside, but not as much as previously. The job postings on Indeed continue to fall towards pre-pandemic. So, and they're now below pre-pandemic levels. Um, so the jobs market is slowly slowing. And the ONS agrees with that assessment. This is the non-seasonally adjusted data. And so you see there has been this rise in the last few weeks, but the general trend is down. Worrying news is that the UK truflation showed a big bounce at the beginning of March and is now back up to 3%. So... Clearly, truflation are seeing some items revised substantially higher in March. And good news was the Bank of England employer survey showed weakening wage expectations. And they are down below 5% in February. And that's good news for the inflation fight. So in summary, <clears throat> UK PMIs. The service sector PMI unexpectedly fell in February, but remains in expansion. The construction PMI is recovering back to neutral, thanks to mainly um, the house builders, retail sales weak, trueflation showing concerning rise in inflation in March. So the UK economy is in a disinflationary stagnation currently, from which it is struggling to recover. On to the EU, Richard. EU CPI at month on month was um, 0.6 percent, as a slightly above expectations. Um, and the ECB thinks inflation is going to fall so fast that it will be cutting interest rates in mm. the early summer. Uh, so we shall see. Yeah, volatile monthly numbers. Yeah, and this is the CPI year on year, uh, which is still on that quite steep downward path although yeah. possibly slowing. Yeah, so still falling, but not as fast as expected. Yeah. And uh, core CPI year on year, 3%. The EU unemployment rate uh, was re revised up and 6.4%, um, only a very small upward revision. But in February, it fell to a new low, Richard which is, you know, yes, concerning. I mean, given the stagnation in the EU economy, yeah. the labour market is really surprisingly tight. Uh, EU PPI month on month, minus 0.9%. Uh, and uh, same as the revised December number. So that's disinflation. Yeah. The, this is the January number, not the February number. The February, yeah. we know inflation spiked, but in January you're seeing strong input price deflation which is great uh eu ppi year on year at uh, minus 8.6 percent and uh small revision in december so that is a, a significant um reduction in prices yeah and the eu manufacturing pmi basically sticking at around about 46 and uh below 50 i guess but um yeah possibly possibly still working its way up well not improving 
and the services PMI is uh, a little bit better than in January. I mean, they're sort of oscillating in this range, aren't they? The services PMI is obviously healthier than the manufacturing mm -hmm. PMI. Yeah, but you know, when you look at that in compared to history, that's still yeah. not a good number, but it is improved. So the composite PMI is, is showing non-growth. <laughs> the EU construction PMI is actually pretty low, isn't it? It's, you know, yeah. it's the level it was back in 2014. Yeah, that's a bad number. It's ticked up, but that's still a really bad number. Yeah. Uh, and what it's really showing, those three charts are really showing, is that manufacturing and construction are, are not doing well. Services mm. are doing better. Yeah. Uh, and, of course, manufacturing and construction are the more energy-intensive sectors. So. Yeah, true. EU retail sales month on month um, at, at expectations. Yeah, very poor, though, 0.1%. And year on year retail sales have actually been below zero since um probably the autumn of twenty twenty two. Uh the economic surprise index for Europe is positive. And so there's our summary. So inflation continuing to fall. Christine Lagarde saying the ECB is on track for his first interest rate cut in June, which I think Keith mentioned earlier. Um speaking as her, her role in the IMF as opposed to her role at the ECB, presumably. Have I got, I've got that the wrong way around, haven't no. I? You see, yeah, she's no longer at the IMF. <laughs> yeah. yeah, cut that bit. Keith. You're behind the times, go on. <laughs> the unemployment rate fell to a new low. The labour market remains tight. We don't know what the participation rate is. And the revised uh, PMIs show that the economy is possibly recovering, but you know, manufacturing and uh, construction are in a poor state. Retail sales are very weak and have been very weak for a long time. So the EU is in a recession, shallow recession. Uh, and it is, I don't know, is, it, is it showing distinct signs of improvement, Keith? Well, I think it is. I think there's, um, you know, the service PMI is definitely up. You know, things are um, economic surprise index, which I know you don't like, is definitely improving. Mm. You know, the participation, sorry, the unemployment rate is really low. And so yeah. that's the amazing thing about the numbers. The mm. EU economy is doing nothing, but yeah. people are remaining in employment. In fact, jobs growth is, is you know, there must be decent jobs growth if the um, unemployment rate keeps on falling. Surprising. Yeah. yeah. Okay, and on to the US. So later today, we have non-farm payrolls. Um, earlier this week, we had the ADP employment change. Reminder, the ADP is actually turns out to be a very poor guide to non-farm payrolls. But that showed decent enough jobs growth in February, though below, below expectations. So the challenge of job cuts for February showed a rise from January and was way above expectations. It also had jolts job openings and they continue to fall slightly, although they marginally beat expectations. The quits rate continues to fall, although didn't fall as much as expectations. So people are staying in their jobs. They're not feeling confident enough to uh, move to uh, new positions. And the hiring rate, I thought this was really interesting. So the hiring rate continues to fall and is well below pre-pandemic levels. Now, previously, when, last month, we talked about non-farm payrolls and how the non-farm payrolls for January was a huge beat. But reminder, non-farm payrolls was revised for the whole of 2023 down by over a million jobs. And then they revised up job creation in um november in november december and january so i think that there's something funny going on with the non-farm payrolls it doesn't seem to be compatible with this falling hiring rate frankly and reminder the um household survey paints a very different picture of us employment which showing falling full-time jobs, rising part-time jobs, and net job losses. 
Now, the various job openings indices are consistent in showing falling job openings. And the quits rate is actually a good indicator of wages. So falling quits rate tends to be highly correlated with the employment cost index. And that hopefully forecasts falling wage inflation in the coming months, touch wood. Now, we also had the RCM TIPP Economic Optimism Index, which is a survey of consumer um, economic optimism, and that has now fallen for two months in a row, so and is below 50. So US consumers, the rise in their sentiment seems to have reversed in the last two months. That is not what we we're expecting. We also had the ISM and manufacturing and non-manufacturing PMIs. The manufacturing PMI fell in February. Again, not what we've been expecting. It had been um, rising for two months prior to that. The employment sub-index fell further towards cyclical lows. New orders fell back. Prices paid fell. That's good news. We all, but we also had the S&P Global Final um, PMI revisions, and that was revised up and is going in the opposite direction to the ISM. You can see the difference between the two here. The um, ISM is much more pessimistic than the S&P Global. So this is the S&P Global Services PMI, which fell back slightly, and the composite rose because of that rise in manufacturing. So the S&P Global is portraying a U.S. economy, which is strengthening. Moving on to the ISM non-manufacturing, well, services fell back in February. Although business activity rose, and the uh, new orders rose slightly, although missed expectations. Employment fell unexpectedly. So both manufacturing and non-manufacturing uh, sectors showed lower employment prospects. They're cutting their employment needs. Prices paid fell back. That's good. Construction spending in January showed the first decline in a year. Now, that could well be weather related. So we need to see what happens in February. And factory orders showed surprising weakness in January. And once again, the um, ISM new orders seems to be a very poor guide to actually what's happening in the world. And New Orders X Transport down as well. So here you have in blue US factory orders. In uh, black dotted line is ISM new manufacturing new orders. So in January showed a sharp spike up. Actual new orders were negative. And US factory orders have been revised down 16 times in the last 21 months. So... The data is not great. It's subject to heavy revisions. This is the US balance of trade, which looks pretty awful. Uh, but it always looks pretty awful. Um, but it missed expectations coming in at minus 67 billion in January. Total vehicle sales, that's substantially below pre-pandemic levels, although not in itself a terribly bad number. Johnson Redbook retail sales ticked up slightly year on year to 3.1%. <coughs> mortgage rates stable around 7%. Mortgage market index ticked up on the week, but is still dead as a dodo. Initial jobless claims, not really very elevated. Um, continuing claims are rising. Let's see how that goes in future weeks. But... 
the fall in the hiring rate suggests that the labor market is weakening and if you are made redundant you're finding it difficult to find a new job and further evidence evidence of a weakening jobs market is warn notices so in the us if you're going to lay off large numbers of people you need to warn the unions and the government and you see the blue line is warn notices arising and with a lag unemployment claims tend to follow it so does that mean that we're going to see rising unemployment claims in the next few months the unemployment rate overall is not rising year on year in a way that is consistent with a coming recession so finally on to the live data so the dallas feds estimate of current us gdp growth is around two percent up on the week the atlanta feds is 2.5 percent down on the week so the two appear to be converging economic surprise index is fading as you'd expect given the uh, all the data we reported this week is slightly weaker than expected and indeed is showing declining job postings so U.S. labor market does appear to be slowly slowing. Great news is that Truflation took a dive. And thank you to our Discord member, Dan Leeds, 1980, for sending me this. This is the U.S. national debt clock. And it's absolutely shocking. So that's the total debt, 34.5 trillion debt per citizen. This is like just the government debt is $102,000 per taxpayer is $266,000. Not great. So in summary, uh, the US jobs market continues to weaken. Now, in previous weeks, the data appeared to be strengthening. It is no longer strengthening. Uh, consumer confidence has been falling now for two months in a row. And both the ISM uh, manufacturing and non-manufacturing PMIs both fell in February. We had been expecting the US economy to start strengthening as the ISM manufacturing and non-manufacturing PMIs had been strengthening over the last couple of months. Well, they're no longer strengthening. And con both construction spending and factory orders fell in January. So although the US economy remains strong recent data suggests it's weakening not strengthening so something to watch in the coming weeks february non-farm payrolls are out later today on to china richard uh, china uh changing manufacturing pmi is in its sort of volatile range but it's above 50 uh so that's some element of growth there all these numbers, obviously, as we say every week, come with a health warning. And the services PMI is also uh, nicely above 50. But down slightly month on month. Yeah, so the composite PMI pretty much flat, actually, month on month, 52.5. And, uh, mm. you know, apart from COVID, that data is uh, very stable. China exports year on year, uh, just ticking up, having fallen below actually i say just ticking out the scale on this chart is quite yeah uh, large so small and so uh seven percent in february up, yeah um, huge beat exactly yeah although on the on the graph it doesn't look like very much china imports year on year uh above so january's were just about zero and so those are picking up is it suggesting that the chinese economy is picking up yeah China balance of trade month on month is um, 75, uh, sorry, 125 billion in January. It's a big, big jump. That's an enormous number. Yeah, and much, much better than any of the previous numbers going back to 2015. Yeah, absolutely amazing number. China has been investing in its industrial sector to try and shift the economy away from its over-reliance on uh, construction. And so... That may mean that there's more goods deflation and it may mean that exports from China become even cheaper. Yeah. 
So the um, National Bureau of Statistics data shows the economy isn't really, it's just slightly growing. It is definitely trying to export its way out of trouble or clearly shifting its economy. And the Chinese economy is looking weak and is very reliant on exports. The interestingly, so I have made one portfolio addition this week, which is oh. to mention now. I bought, let me just correct it. I bought the iShares China large cap ETF. My God. Gone. Well, on the basis of um, has China bottomed? Yeah. Um, I'd say there's a very weak link between GDP growth and equity performance, actually, Richard. Very true, Keith. Yeah. And, you know, as you know, um, I have lost money on Chinese equities because it just turns out to be opaque. And, you know, the accounts are just awful. So, you know, I just don't trust them. Is that well, well, I'll keep people posted with how this well, investment yeah. is going. Keith. Well, there's an inverse correlation between what I've been doing at the moment and how well, it, well, well it's been doing. <laughs> yes. So you're probably going to be fine, Richard. I just felt I should diversify away a little bit from my... Yeah. Um, uh, so, uh, do you want to do China's savings? Because you know what's yeah. coming up. Yeah. <clears throat> so while we're talking about China, let's talk about its savings rate because that has huge implications for the global economy. So this is all from Martin Wolf in the FT. And he was pointing out that China's savings rate is 28% of global savings. So the US and the EU combined are 33%. So China has an absolutely enormous savings rate. Now, historically, it has invested those savings in largely in property. But obviously, we know that the Chinese property sector is not doing well, and it's suffered from actually massive overinvestment. Um, and so you've seen you know, property developers going bust and the property investment in China declining over the last couple of years. So what is it now going to do with its excess savings? It should be attempting to balance to reduce its savings and therefore rebalance the economy away from massive infrastructure and property investment into consumption. So both government and private sector consumption. But that implies actually changes to the society. So you know, reducing wealth inequality, giving workers more wages, etc., and it does not appear that the Chinese Communist Party is willing to consider that. So if China continues to generate huge savings, where is that money going to flow? You've, we've showed you a chart earlier showing that it's been investing in the industrial sector. Well, without an increase in Chinese consumption, who is going to consume the output of an enlarged Chinese industrial sector? Answer, and we've seen this in the trade balance, foreigners. And so what China appears to be doing is exporting its savings in the form of a massive current account surplus. So reminder, the capital and financial accounts are the inverse of the current account. So if you imagine a Chinese manufacturer, he sells a machine to the US for $1,000. In return, he has money, $1,000. So in order to pay his workers, he needs yuan. So he sells the $1,000 to the Chinese central bank, and this in return for yuan, and then the Chinese central bank buys T bills. So, in essence, the Americans have bought the machinery <laughs> by borrowing, by expanding their debt to China. It's a little bit like Target 2 in Europe, isn't it, Keith? Yeah, 
Absolutely. So the result is, and and frankly, there's reason to believe that the official um, Chinese balance of payment figures actually understate the true extent of their balance of payments. If you look at the customs data, it's even higher. Now, there are some little quirks in the, the customs data. So if um, China, for example, imports a load of oil and then re-exports it, that causes dis distortions between the balance of payments and the customs data. But you'll notice that two were very highly correlated until a couple of years ago, yep. suggesting something else is going on. on. And as evidence of the impact of Chinese industrial investment, this is the balance of payments in automobiles and parts. And you'll see all that industrial investment has made Chinese EVs very competitive and they've swung from a deficit in finished automobiles to actually they could well dominate global EV sales. So going forwards, there is very little evidence that the Chinese economy is rebalancing towards consumption from investment. It is still generating this huge savings surplus. Well, so what we've seen so far is it's running massive and growing current account surpluses, which implies the rest of the world is running big deficits with China and increasing its debts to China. So as long as that continues, we're going to have goods deflation, <clears throat> but at the expense of the industrial sectors of all the Western economies. And you can see in Germany how the industrial sector is struggling to recover and is shrinking. Now, the danger here is trade wars, tariffs, and the only way to reduce Chinese uh, surplus is by putting uh, tariffs on them. And then you get um, retaliatory tariffs and a shrinkage in global trade, which is very bad for the world economy. Richard, what are your thoughts? China is it's clearly sort of on the economic war path, isn't it? I mean, it, it is effectively trying to eat um non-Chinese electric vehicle production. Yeah. Um, there has been, there is still a huge danger in its over-reliance on the construction sector. It's clearly trying to move rapidly away from that, uh, which is very sensible. I think the move is dangerous for the Chinese Communist Party because if they don't get it right, they mm. end up with all sorts of social disruption and possibly a threat to them. I suppose how much of, of what's going on is is deliberate and how much is it just a, an unforeseen consequence? So are they simply steering the economy, trying to steer the economy using big levers and they don't really care what else happens? Uh, and I suspect the answer to that is yes. So Yeah, no, I agree with you. I think basically they're stuck and they don't they don't want to free up the economy. Yeah. So and my my last point really is what what happens what happens to their foreign exchange reserves because I mean, not what happens to them they go up what do they do with them because they don't want us dollars well like it or not they're buying a lot of um you know us treasury bills you know that what they're getting in return is us assets yeah so um what does what does that do and and, and uh, yeah they they how they are the you know, the US is undermining its own currency by introducing financial san sanctions around the world and threatening to confiscate assets and so forth. So what does China do if it wishes to not expose itself to that risk? Well, it can't. It can't have it both ways. You know, no. can't, you know, um, run huge current account surpluses with the uh, US and therefore accept US um, financial assets in return. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and you know what should happen is the yuan should appreciate, yes, to reduce the Chinese current account balance. But as they're controlling the yuan, this is clearly a matter of policy. Yeah, yeah. Good point, Keith. So basically, they're slightly, slightly rogue act. And rogue isn't the right word. They are, they are operating in ice. 
in isolation of the West and without really um, caring what happens to the West. Well, the, I think their primary concern is maintaining social stability in China. And, you know, what they're doing is there's a, the lack of demand from the property sector now. So they're trying to uh, move jobs into the industrial sector and rely on demand from the rest of the world to uh, create jobs in China. Yeah, yeah, that's right. It's interesting, isn't it? Very interesting. So is it right oh. to invest in Chinese large companies? Well, do, do you think they're actually, you know, the thing is, Richard, do you think your economic rights are enforceable in China? No. No. Well, there you go. That's as far as I'm concerned, that's it. You know, um, I did a My Worst Trade, which everyone can watch on Asian Citrus, which had a, a P ratio of less than two, according to the accounts. <laughs> Reality was it didn't have any earnings at all. It didn't have any forests, didn't have any fruit. It was like they just made the numbers up and actually run off with all the money. Mm. So, you know. okay. Point taken, Keith. Yeah. So anyway, this is uh, Chinese retail sales. And you know, if China was rebalancing towards consumption, you'd expect to see a systematically you know, rising uh, retail sales much faster than um, GDP growth. And actually, currently, it is growing faster than GDP growth. But I don't think you can say that over the last few years that it's been rising substantially. So bottom line is there's seems to be no change in the status quo as is. In fact, the um, Chinese current account surplus just keeps on rising. And that's good news for goods deflation around the world, but bad news for manufacturing elsewhere. And on to one chart. Now, we have talked in previous weeks about how the rise in U.S. interest rates has had absolutely no effect on corporate interest payments in the U.S. In fact, corporate interest payments have fallen because the U.S. corporations managed to lock in a low interest rate debt, in part because the Fed was so slow in raising interest rates. But... Going forwards, the ratio of corporate debt to earnings is very high, five times. So when that debt is refinanced towards current interest rates, that is going to eat into corporate profits. So currently, all of the interest rates on that debt is really low. But yeah, you know, interest rates in the US currently 5%. If that was all refinanced at 5%, then it would eat up 25% of US corporate profits. So going forwards, unless interest rates come down, US earnings are going to struggle due to higher interest rate payments, interest payments. And on to Inflation Watch, Richard. So um, we've got not a lot to report, really. Um, we've shown you the two inflation charts already. Bank of England and ECB are meeting on the 21st of March. So by the end of March, we'll have some uh, more updates on where we are with interest rates. Wage growth for new hires US. Uh, in the US is lower than for existing employees, suggesting the uh, slowing jobs market. Yeah. I mean, so this is interesting, actually, because... You know, we've seen that the, the quits rate, well, is is very low. So yeah. what? basically there's no incentive for people to move. Now, one of they're not quitting their job is that the um, employers aren't paying any premium anymore for new hires. Headline PCE inflation is 2.4% in the US January. Broader measures of inflation are showing it actually to be somewhat higher. Um, have a look at... Uh, have a look at those the um but they're all moving in that consistent downward direction they are on a six month annualized basis um pc inflation is very close to the fed's target of two percent yeah but there's that nasty jump in january yeah it's a kick isn't there i mean yeah. there have been kicks previously in that downtrend so yep. it's not necessarily problematic but clearly they want to be cautious about it 
Yeah, and actually the last big kick up was in January last year. So mm. Yeah, and they're very sensitive about making the same mistake they made before. And the New York Fed survey of consumer inflation expectations shows the lowest since records began. And if you remember last week, or was it the week before, we just discussed how actually it was it was getting higher. Yeah. That's right. But different surveys, frankly, go yeah. Use different results, but this is a good number. Yeah. US monthly um rents are falling. They're now uh negative. The rate of growth is negative. And apartment vacancy rents are rising, suggesting rental inflation is going to be subdued. Uh, so the manufacturer's private pay prices paid survey suggesting inflationary pressures are rising. Uh so I mean that is quite a noisy if you look back, there are you know, mm -hmm. jumps, jumps, jumps around quite a bit. It hasn't jumped in an extraordinary fashion yet. No, but it what it's basically saying is that the extraordinary goods deflation we saw last year is probably over. Yes. So bouncing January inflation um is against the general current general trend. Um ISM prices pay components uh shows inflation falling back in February. And we've obviously got strong goods deflation, which is actually likely to be enhanced by what's going on with China. That's true. And uh, but the Fed, understandably, given the mess they made of um, transitory inflation, is very wary about moving too quickly. Yeah. Thank you, Richard. OK, this week's quiz. You ready for this? This exceptional artwork is for sale to you, Richard. Hmm. It is the NFT called Crypto Punk. 3100 and this literally is it and it is special because it's only one of 406 cyberpunks that have a headband are you not so tempted so is it an is this an original keith well it's a it's an nft so basically anyone like me can do a screenshot and use it but if you buy the <laughs> nft somewhere on a ledger it says you have paid for it. That's okay, the, that's the only reason NFTs exist. And the quiz, the quiz is how much of my hard. Uh, so, yeah, sixty five pounds. Well, you're a very generous man, Richard, and that that's more than I'd pay for it. <laughs> but it actually went for sixteen million dollars. <laughs> so, Roth is back. I mean. I, I was I was outbid. You outbid. And during the you know depths of the crypto winter, bids which weren't accepted went as low as two hundred dollars. And now it's sold for well, sixteen million. Well, who's the lucky chap who's got it or girl? Yeah, I've no idea. Animal spirits are high. Yeah. Okay. Excellent. Right. So that's part one of the quiz. Part right. two of the quiz. U.S. wholesaler Costco. Have you ever been to a Costco? I have, yeah. They're great, yeah, yeah. They're lovely places to wander around. Have you been to one? I have, yeah. yeah. There's uh, lots of tempting offers. And, you know, given that I'm old and I'm trying to resist the accumulation of tat, mm. it's a very dangerous place to go. Isn't it? Just, yeah, because you need one of those, whatever it is, don't it, you? Exactly, <laughs> yes. So anyway, U.S. wholesaler Costco. The quiz for you is what is the PE ratio, okay? So these are the revenue growth, which I think you could say is pretty impressive. Yeah. Yeah, 6.8% yeah. revenue growth in the year to September. Yeah. Earnings per share, also pretty impressive. Yeah. But the margins are awful. You know, this is high volume, low margin, yeah, yep. it's a supermarket. It's a it's a retailer, wholesaler retail. Yeah. So the question for you, Richard, is what sort of earnings multiple, a P ratio, what P ratio would you put on this this Eight. business? Eight. Actually, in the private market where we see this sort of business, you know, um up for sale in uh as an angel investment, you know, eight would be quite high. It doesn't have that scale, obviously. 
but the actual answer is 53. It's on a trailing P ratio of 53 and a forward P ratio of 49. Yeah, what can I say? I, what can I'm, you say? I'm just so out of touch. <laughs> I'm sorry, it's my fault. It's, that's just an astonishing number. It's, it is priced like a big growth stock. with And P ratio of that, you're implying that what? It's going to be in the next 20 years, it's going to, it's going to keep on growing at this enormous pace. Or well, the steady pace, and I I just don't get it. And the thing, basically, momentum stocks have just got enormous momentum. I think is all you can say. Yeah. And as the cocoa price is going through the roof, we're going to have a brief review of agricultural commodities. So this is canola, which is rapeseed oil. That is a very good chart. Price has collapsed from its pandemic highs and is trending down. And actually, it does not look that uh, elevated in absolute terms compared to history. Cheese, again, fallen right back down. Great news. Cocoa, going through the roof. That is a record high and we've got big problems with the crop in West Africa. Um, likely to go higher. Coffee. Actually, it's had a bit of a bounce uh, the last three months, but, you know, not mm. particularly elevated, certainly down from its pandemic highs. Corn falling again, actually back to pre-pandemic levels. Great news. Oats also fallen right back down and falling. Orange juice. Um, we have problems with the crop in Florida. And orange juice prices remain high. Palm oil actually has fallen from its pre-pandemic highs, but is not back to uh, pre-pandemic levels. Rice, not great. Soybeans falling back again. It's good news. Sugar also down, but nowhere near pre-pandemic levels. Wheat, that's great. Main staple is bumper crops, prices falling. So that adds up to a world food price index, which is steadily falling, mainly thanks to falling prices of the staples, wheat, corn. All of that is good news. So there are shortages in a few food commodities, all of which were impacted by climate change to some extent. So that's cocoa, rice, and orange juice. But we're having bumper crops of wheat, corn, canola. Just a quick point here, Keith. Some, some of us do consider chocolates to be a staple. <laughs> yes. And on to recession watch. Now, according to EPB Research, their leading index has actually been falling in line with previous economic cycles, which is odd given that we know the US economy, and this is for the US, has not turned down in any way. Now, what makes this cycle different is that you would expect the leading index to lead the coincident, and so the coincident should turn down in line with the leading index with a lag and it just ain't you see the black line is current and previous cycles have been uh, much worse although note the lag between the start of the inversion and actually when things do really start to turn down actually based on historic cycles it is too soon to call a soft landing so as a result, the US economy is just not turning down as it has in previous cycles. But, you know, the long lags mean that actually it was not clear that we are yet confirmed in a soft landing. Yeah. And the can, I just, go on. can I just comment? So one of the things that struck me, Keith, was your the chart that showed the... Um, 
impact of uh, having to refi companies corporates having to refinance at much higher interest rates or their profits mm. and that has that will impact the economy when it happens yeah and it's not inconsistent therefore with what we're seeing yes that's true yeah although i think the majority of um refinancings don't occur for you know until next year and beyond yeah so high yield um companies do ha tend to have uh shorter refinancing cycles because you know investors are not willing to extend the money for a very long period of time so you know, they will be more impacted but so hang so the um the reason the coincident has not turned down is that some cyclical sectors, which should you'd expect to turn down with the rise in the interest rates, just have not responded to higher interest rates. So house building being the, the prime one. And unless you get a downturn in the house building sector, then it is difficult to see how you get a severe recession. You get a slight slowdown, but no, you normally what you expect to see is job losses in the house building and manufacturing sectors causing, causing a cascade of slowing through the economy. And if the house building sector is not slowing down, then it's difficult to see that getting started. But there is a lot of evidence that certainly amongst the poorer members of US society that they are struggling to make ends meet. So this is serious delinquencies for auto loans, which is the red line, and credit card loans, which is the black line. And auto loans are concerning because that is the generally the last thing that people want to default on because they need their car. And if you look at the who is issuing those credit cards, well, the difference between small banks and large banks is really stark. The credit card delinquency rate for small banks is vastly higher than for large banks. And we know that small banks are mainly responsible for lending to small businesses in the US. And, you know, this is another drain on their profitability. And one of the funny things about the ISM is that the employment index, so that's the average of both the manufacturing and non-manufacturing indices, keeps on falling, although the headline PMIs have been rising or have been heading back to neutral in the case of manufacturing and are above neutral in the case of services. You know, when you look at GDP forecasts, the US is doing fine. Everywhere else, eight. The UK, bottom of the pack, despite Jeremy Hunt's efforts to raise UK growth, Richard. So one of the um, differences, I think, is, I mean, the US has got this huge deficit spending. Yeah. Which no no one else has got. I mean, we, yes. we, we've got a big deficit, but we can't increase it. And the US yeah. is increasing its deficit. And that is going into GDP. Yeah, I completely agree. Um, and finally, this is a chart showing interest-bearing deposits compared to pre-pandemic. And you see, well, one of the things we've been discussing a lot over the course of the last year is the level of excess US savings. And this would tend to suggest that excess savings are finally being drained, which means that US consumer spending will start to fall. And we know that US savings rate has been very low. So the US consumers have consumed their excess savings. They will now have to start pulling in their horns and boosting their savings again. And all that will mean a slowing economy. So bottom line is that we're not out of the woods yet. The US economy has been incredibly strong. But when you look at the lags in previous cycles, the, the fact it's been strong does not necessarily mean it has avoided a slowdown altogether. And employment intentions 
hit a new cycle low in February, and there are increasing indications of consumer stress. So Keith has dug out this rather interesting story, and it's called The Line. So Saudi Arabia is proposing to build a futuristic linear city as part of their NEON project. So it'll stretch 110 miles, 170 kilometers from the Red Sea to the city of Tabruk. And it will have no cars, streets or carbon emissions. And it will eventually house 9 million people, which is 25% of the country's population. Okay. So what does it look like? Well, this is it. This is a bit of it. Obviously, this is a bit of cat, but the line will consist of two mirrored buildings, each 200 metres wide, 500 metres tall, and 170 kilometres long. And in between the two buildings, there will be an outdoor space. So the outdoor space will effectively be caught, um, demarcated by two 500 metre tall buildings. Definition of outdoor, I suppose, comes to mind. But mm. because of its linear design, apparently it will have only 2% of the footprint of conventional cities. Um, you can see that might work. Uh, an artist's impression of the outdoor space in between the two buildings. And of course, it is somewhat narrow because it's not as wide as the buildings are tall. So it has some very noticeable features, vertically layered homes, offices, public parks, and public schools, year round climate control, all indoor and outdoor spaces, high speed uh, rail with just four stops or transport residents from one end to the other in 20 minutes. That's, um, what's that three, so 500 kilometers an hour. Yeah. The five minute walk to all amenities. I mean, you're meaning you're within five a five minute walk of any of the amenities, and walking distance to parks and natural uh, elements two meters, two minute walk, which is the sort of the just time it takes to walk through the depth of a building. Yeah. Can you go outside it, or is that not counted? Um, this is another interior shot. Uh, it's looking long, a lot of greenery there. Well, actually, I, I, when I wrote this, I said it, see, it appeared incompatible with the other one. But actually, I don't think this is true, because yeah. I think this is the bottom. And yeah. reminder looking... that these these buildings are meant to be 500 metres tall. Yeah. I mean, that is, that's much. How tall is the shard? So about 300 metres? It, yeah, it's not 500 metres. That's 15, 1,650 feet. I mean, enormously tall. This is, so it's the mirror, so on the right, basically, you've got the, the uh, mirror of the outside wall, which should enable it to blend into its surroundings. Yeah. Notice how tall this cruise ship is and how side of this building. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Yeah. It is. Um, I mean, I wonder how they keep the glass clean. Well, I was thinking that as well, Richard. <laughs> <laughs> so they estimate... That the infrastructure will cost 100 to 200 billion and the total cost will be 500 billion and as keith just said to me a minute ago how much is the hs2 which is about 50 billion and so the question is how can you possibly build this enormous structure for 500 billion anyway yeah the groundwork has started they've created two paths one on either side by the look of it, they're probably wider than that yeah. roads, I expect. Well, apparently piling has started, which amazing. So I I read about this and I just thought it was fantasy. I just said yeah. there's no way they'd do this. <clears throat> but actually they are. I'm I'm flabbergasted. Well, it's an it will be an extraordinary structure if it's ever completed. So what could we say? It's a big infrastructure project. It may have a time and cost overrun. Yeah. It will require <laughs> vast quantities of steel, concrete, and glass, and vast quantities of money, and one suspects energy yeah. in order to build it. Yeah. So, you know, it's going to require that it continues to sell a lot of oil at high prices, and uh, it's got a very tricky balancing act between managing the um, 
optimizing its income from the oil price versus volume equation. Yeah, absolutely. And um, it does amazing. seem, you know, I would say, it, well, why not just build 10 kilometers, which is big enough, and see if you can see if it works. Well, I think they're going to do that, Richard. They've got no choice. You can't start, you know, piling 170 kilometers, two 170 kilometer buildings, each 200 meters wide. It is, it is extraordinary. It's extraordinary. Yeah. It just seems insane. Well, thanks for digging that out, Keith. <laughs> we will see what happens. Exactly, yeah. I, may I predict that in five years' time, there will be these kind of skeleton buildings rotting in the desert. And on to other charts. So this is a website visits to um, ChatGPT and other AI sites. And we know NVIDIA's chip sales going through the roof. Actually, site visits ain't going through the roof. They actually peaked over a year ago and are going nowhere. Although you'll see that Google's Bard is gaining popularity. But this is far from exponential growth. Um, one thing we've covered and is to be celebrated is that ESG funds were total nonsense. People have given up on them. So we use a hell of a lot of fossil fuels. If we're going to keep on using them, we need to invest in them. And I thought this was interesting. This is the uh, budgets of NATO. And you look at this and you think Donald Trump may have a point, actually. So... Bad news on climate change, frankly. This is global surface sea temperatures, and this this is so bad. Um, you know, the red line is this year, and in the UK, we've just had a record February in terms of temperatures, and this year is starting with um, record um, temperatures. So... We've talked previously about agricultural prices. Well, you know, expect more disruption to the uh, global food chain. And on to good news. Well, did you know that there are amphibian rescue groups all around the UK? Volunteers who go out at night in the breeding season and they catch amphibians and transport them across the road to stop them being squashed. So there, in England, there are 203 groups, and they reckon they've saved 115,000 uh, animals last year. Charlecombe Toad Rescue near Bath have cut the toad fatality rate from 60% to 3%. So Fantastic. They, and they're looking for volunteers, Richard, you know. If you're feeling an insomniac, you can go out and rescue some toads. I'll bear it in mind. Yeah. And on to equities, Richard. Okay. Okay. So the FTSE All World Equity Index continues its inexorable climb upwards. Yep. Uh, the FTSE All Share Index continues it in its inexorable going nowhere. Yeah. But at least they had an up week. Still down on the year. Yeah. The year of stocks 600 is doing what the FTSE all sh the uh, world index is doing, basically. Yeah, I am remain mystified by this. You know, given in October to where it is now, nothing's happened to the EU economy in that period. No. S&P 500 you know, clearly it basically is a large chunk of the world index, so it's doing exactly the same thing. And uh, powering ahead, the so NASDAQ Composite doing the same thing. The Russell 2000 has joined in the party. It has. Yeah, absolutely. The Hang Seng is miserable. But you're propping it up, Richard, with your... Well, I've started to prop it up, Keith, clearly, although I'm beginning to wonder whether it was a wrong, a wrong move. Um, well, you need to buy some more. You know, it didn't have any effect last week. You heard it here first, guys. <laughs> Keith is recommending Chinese big cap. <laughs> no, All I'm right? recommending other people by the way. <laughs> <laughs> help, help bail you out, Richard. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Topics is uh powering ahead as as uh, in the same vein as the others. Uh, Bitcoin is having a very, very good time at the moment. It's up what 20 
30 30 percent in the last um yeah month or so uh the pound is ticking up a little bit against the dollar so it's actually it's just just uh, just no things through that peak that it had at the beginning of the year but uh, the dollar index isn't yet out of its 107 to 1.0 range mm. there's the euro which is up against the dollar but still within that range and i expect we've got a dollar index next yes there it is so sort of more or less in the middle no we're not in it we're towards the bottom of the range but notice it doesn't hasn't yet dropped below 100 i think if it were to drop yeah. below 100 and it's not near that point yet uh, that would be quite seminal for the dollar. So the VIX is um, it's actually considerably up on the year, but it's still historically low levels. Yeah. Uh, British UK equity market, uh, Ford PE versus the S&P Ford PE. One of them is cheap. One of them is expensive. Yeah, but it's the, the way they've dramatically widened. Yeah. Actually, it's from like, mid 2018 yeah so this happened all pre-pandemic yeah but that in the last you know eight years there's been enormous divergence yeah there has, isn't there? and uh the problem with the uk is that earnings have not been growing and yeah. uh, uk versus uk equity markets relative earnings since 1990 and you can see how that uh is falling that is so, shocking actually yeah that's absolutely shocking but this is part of the productivity lack of investment issue isn't it interestingly mm. it predates completely predates brexit yeah it does yeah this isn't a brexit effect no but the productivity and gdp growth is a brexit effect so. yeah well I don't, Margin. it's hard to disentangle everything isn't it but you know what i mean yeah. Um, so not just the Mag Seven, the equal weighted S and P is closing at all time high. Obviously, the Mag Mag Seven has been the the front runner here, but um, mm -hmm. the S and P five hundred equal weight index is also. Yeah, we've had a very broad based rally since the lows in October. So enterprise value to sales ratio, uh, portion of stocks on that ratio greater than ten, is high and rising. And um, it never ends well. No, it doesn't, does it? So the valuation at the start of the period is, explains eighty percent of the subsequent return of the returns over the subsequent decade. So right now, the um, expected return on that basis, the F S and P five hundred, would be two percent per annum over the next ten years. Yep, but it's not starting yet, is it, Keith? <laughs> well right now it's going through the roof yeah so we've got the um the enormous eight and um is it just really the mag two or three i mean it, yes that shows that uh even within the magnificent seven there's a big diversification and some of them are no longer magnificent yeah they're not bad either though um Quarter four earnings growth, the S&P was very strong at plus 22% year on year. And uh, if you get 22% year on year growth earnings, you would say that maybe your PE should be around 20 to 25. But we've got big divergences between Magnificent Seven, whose earnings growth is vastly out, out um, outpacing its sales growth. And I know we know NVIDIA, which we discussed last week, is one of the reasons for that. Yeah. Profit margins are, uh, are rising. And the S&P 500, excluding those, basically earnings growth is negative and sales growth is marginal. Yeah. Big tech still seeing earnings estimates rise, uh, suggesting fundamentally their margins are rising. The EU is trying to address Apple's margins. Yeah. Taking lots of um, action against its dominant market position. But it's that dominant market position that enables them to... Uh, ratchet up their margins and the earnings per share of the S&P 500 has just hit a new all-time high and S&P 500 sales per share growth is actually declining yeah so this is exactly what you'd expect from the fall in inflation yeah so in order to keep earnings growth high they're going to have to start cutting costs which is recessionary yeah 
We'll see. We've been talking about this for a long time, though. Yeah, it's contributory. I mean, it's not. Yeah. So real sales growth was only 1.4%, which actually is less significantly less than GDP. True. So if if we we're, uh, were in a dot-com bubble, the red line there, uh, the AI bubble has got a long way to go yet. This is not a logarithmic scale. Nope. Nope. A lot of long, long way to go. Yeah. So fill your boots. Is that the message we're giving people, Keith? <laughs> well... You've got I'm to stop not, making I'm... these recommendations, Keith. Yeah, just well, to... well, basically, yeah, I do have some because but I've been totally wrong on just about everything <laughs> in the last 18 months. But, you know. And yes, anyway. that start strongly tend to uh, stay strong. So we've had a strong start to the, to the year. And uh, so the, the, the suggestion is that it's going to remain strong this year. And interest, easing, interest rate easing cycles tend to drive stock market higher as you'd expect because a higher PE ratio yeah. uh, is sort of implicit in that. And analysts are super bullish on tech growth forecasts. Now we'll see, won't we? I've given up trying to forecast tech growth. Well, yeah. Because it's virtually impossible to get it right. So when analysts are highly bullish, they're usually wrong, basically is what this is saying. Well yes. So um there you go. Have a look at that chart. But um is everybody yep. jumping on the bandwagon too late? Well, maybe they are, maybe they're not. Hey, thank you, Richard. On to commodities and general, the uh, dollar weakness uh, meant that commodities had a good week. Energy was up, on, oil was up on the back of the OPEC Plus meeting. Uranium actually bucked the trend and had a down week. Has it peaked? Question mark. No, um, no. Industrial metals had a good week in general. And precious metals had a fantastic week. Gold was up over 5%, silver up over 8%. So energy, so this is Brent, ticked up 1% on the week and is up 8% year to date. WTI up 1.5% on the week, up 11% year to date. Numbers specifically on market, well... We had another crude draw in the US, down 5.5 million barrels, excluding the SPR. Reminder, the EIA are saying that the oil market will be in deficit in Q1 and then move to surplus for the rest of the year. Are we seeing that? Uh, US crude production actually dipped down 100,000 barrels a uh, day from last week and is off its record highs. The Baker Hughes rig count ticked up by three. I said earlier that the EIA was forecasting that the oil market would be in deficit in Q1 and then in surplus the rest of the year. And you can see that from the oil futures curve, which is in backwardation. So current prices are higher than future prices. But there's no lack of demand. World oil demand has reached a new high, apparently, and shows little sign of peaking. Moving on to natural gas, um, up 2.4% on the week, but seems to be fading again the last few days, down 20% on the year. And if we look at where we are getting our LNG from, we've massively increased our purchases of US LNG in the last couple of years and looking at gas reserves around the world we have a hell of a lot of natural gas so total proven reserves are 188 trillion cubic meters last year consumption was four so on the Gas reserves, we all gas discoveries we already know, we believe is there. We've got almost 50 years worth of current world consumption. There's a lot of gas. Um, UK natural gas futures followed the EU up 3.7% over the last week, but fading again the last few days, down 19% on the year. US natural gas, well, there's a glut. It's faded by 3.8% over the week, down 28% year to date. And EQT, 
the US's largest producer of natural gas, has announced that it would reduce production by uh, 1 billion cubic feet per day, around 6.5% of its output in response to low prices. So you are seeing a supply response in response to low market prices. Coal ticked up 3.4%, but still down 7% year to date. Uranium, is that a near-term high or is that the all-time high? Yeah, well, actually, if you put if you look at a moving average, it'll bump down onto its move one of its moving averages. Keith, I suspect it's going to go up from here because I think the driver, my personal view, the driver for increased uranium prices has not gone away. Right. And on to industrial metals, Richard. That's Keith. So just looking at the chart, says aluminium, cobalt. Seventy-five uh, percent of the world's cobalt production comes from the Democratic Republic of Congo. Um using small artisanal miners mm. with child labor it's bad for us bad for the environment bad for congo bad for children of congo there's copper and now is it about to break through that line yeah it's been surprisingly weak for the last year is it yeah finally showing some life so my copper mining investments have been surprisingly weak. Well, not surprisingly weak. They've been weak in alignment with the price of copper. Mm. So I'm keeping my fingers crossed that copper price is going to go up. Uh, chromium, iron ore. I mean, obviously, the Saudi Arabian plan is going to increase demand for iron ore substantially, or, or yeah. steel, Yeah, more precisely. Uh, lithium looks like it has made a bottom. It does, yeah. Neodymium, nickel. Yeah, after we discussed last week how the nickel was going to remain in glut for the next seven years, well, suddenly the nickel price, you know, ticks up. Tin, or vanadium, zinc. Yeah, so generally, actually, industrial metals having a decent week. The precious metals, as Keith said earlier, have had an excellent. So gold is continually making its broker through its all time high and is continuing on its uptrend. So there's mark change in its behavior over the last uh, week, really. Mm. In fact, and if, funnily enough, after we'd finished last week's portfolio matters, is when this move started. Really? Mm. So silver is um, it's, it's still within that quite broad range that we've talked about previously it is moving up quite fast but it's still within that range the sort of breakout for silver really probably come comes at around about 27 or 28 dollars and it, it's nowhere near there yet so it's lagging gold's performance platinum rhodium and palladium so palladium actually had a good week didn't it up nine percent on the week mm. yeah the PGMs are mainly used in catalytic converters. Yeah, mm. I think the you know, demand is doomed, basically. Yeah. Okay, and on to interest rates and bond yields. Thank you, Richard. So this is UK yield curve. And finally, shifting down. So you'll notice that over the next two years, UK bond yields are what? At 4.3%? You know, seems extraordinarily high. So the, the market, we showed you the chart uh, last week or the week before of the UK term premium over 10 years, and that is actually negative. So the bond yields essentially can be equated to is, um, the expected interest rates over the period. And what this yield curve is currently saying is they don't expect... Um, long-term interest rates dip below much below four percent which seems extraordinary to me as we have long-term growth forecasts of 1.7 percent i think the bank of england is going to have to cut rates to stimulate the uk economy in the way that the us doesn't given the us is growing absolutely fine so but the us yield curve has also ticked down over the last month it's good news now, let's talk about R star. Reminder, R star is the natural rate of interest. And a study from the Bank of International Settlements came out this week in which they discussed whether R star had 
increased post pandemic. And so R star is determined by the balance of saving and investment in the economy. And it should be independent of monetary policy. Factors which would tend to lower R star. So lower potential growth. So countries with lower potential growth should have lower R star because there's low return on investment, therefore there's lower demand for investment. Countries with longer life expectancy will have a lower R star because there's more savings. So the balance of savings investment is in favor of savings. Higher inequality means higher savings rates, means lower R star. Higher risk aversion means higher saving rate and lower propensity to invest and a lower R star. And finally, a lower fiscal deficit means more aggregate savings and lower R star. So when we look at changes to those factors since the pandemic, potential growth rate, well, does anyone think it's changed very much? I'm just not sure it has, frankly. I mean, when you look at the OBR's forecast for UK, they're really not good. Um, and in fact, the way the Chinese are exporting that lowers the um, industrial uh, production of um, Western countries. Life expectancy everywhere is just steadily drifting up. That is unchanged. Inequality, actually, that's unchanged. Although you could say the fiscal monetary stimulus of the pandemic era has primarily benefited the already wealthy. Risk aversion, well, risk aversion is currently low. I mean, the um, AI bubble, if it is a bubble, would seem to indicate the return of animal spirits. I mean, we're showing you the price of Dogecoin. You know, it's difficult to see that that as anything but the return of speculation. The one thing that absolutely has changed is fiscal deficits are up. In the case of the UK, they're forecast to come down in the coming years. In the case of the US, they ain't. So the bottom line is, Change in R star will depend on the relative effect of the large rise in fiscal deficits compared to the other long-term factors, which are largely unchanged, would suggest that R star should fall back towards its pre-pandemic levels. And so if you look at the estimates of R star, well, they are absolutely all over the place. Pause, take a look, you know, get your darts out. It's um, you, you can't do any investing based on the um, R star estimates. Um, but Christine Lagarde is um, stated that she expected that the EU was on track to start cutting rates in June. And that is what the market is expecting. The market is expecting four rate cuts by the end of the year. And. Historically, bond, high bond yields mean high future bond returns. And so, given current bond yields, we should expect um, seven-year forward bond returns of around 5% per annum. How has QT affected bond yields? Answer, not by very much, actually. QT is estimated to have affected bond yields between six and eight basis points, i.e. bugger all. And if you look at how much QT has been done, well, central bank balance sheets have been shrinking, but they are nowhere near back to their pre-pandemic levels. Still a long way to go. And what is really frustrating for the Fed is that it's been raising interest rates and been talking about having higher rates for longer, but financial in, uh, conditions in the US have been easing and eased substantially. So if financial conditions are easing, why does the Fed need to cut rates given the US economy is creating jobs and um, seems to be growing just fine? Although Jerome Powell did state that they were intending to cut rates um, this year. Okay, on to the yield. So this is the UK two year, still at 4.3%. You know, 
seems very high to me, given the uh, low growth of, well, the fact the UK economy is in a recession and growth forecasts are incredibly low. As inflation comes under control, I think the Bank of England is going to have to cut rates hard to try and stimulate the economy. There's the UK 10-year high, 30-year high, but um, fading again, which is great news for me. US 10-year coming down as on disappointing uh, economic data recently. German 10-year also fading as we approach in, uh, interest rate cuts in the EU. Italian, that's a big drop. Greek also dropping. So concluding comments. Well, this week we've seen a rally in pretty much everything after dovish speeches by Jay Powell and Christine Lagarde. And we're approaching um june when the ecb is expected to start cutting rates and i think that's when the bank of england is also likely to start cutting rates and falling risk uh falling interest rates are putting um a driving asset club prices up for all asset classes including dogecoin richard how do you get on this week well i had a fairly reasonable week tax case because the obviously the move in precious metals is significant and the Precious metal miners, which I have all things in, as people know, have also started to move up after what's been a fairly dire period. So um, my week was reasonably satisfactory, but um, I um, I think that silver is definitely not broken out. So uh, until silver gets up to the high twenties, it's not going to attract the vast amount of buying in the silver miners. Um, the other thing I'd just like to say on comment on gold is that my thesis for buying gold is that has been now investing in gold rather has been that uh, government debt is out of control and that uh, the, the um, constant depreciation of the value of, of uh, fiat currencies and I think that's fundamentally, I think that's what's going on here, uh, combined with actually various states wishing to get out from underneath uh, the the dollar, um, and which is why central banks around the world are buying so much gold. Yeah. And so I think there's a number of factors that underlie the rise in gold, which means my personal view is it's not a flash in the pan. Yeah. It will continue. I don't disagree with that. Um I've talked about this before, but, but you know, my I set up child sips for both my children when they're young, and I'm keeping them going actually now that they're at university because um, you get um, an up is it twenty five percent uplift from the government? So uh, yeah. for every uh, you know, if you put in two hundred pounds, the the act they actually receive I think two hundred and fifty or two hundred forty two hundred fifty. Um, so it's a good way of transferring some money to your kids, basically tax efficiently. Um, yeah. My daughter's got no interest in investing and just sticks it all in gold. She's doing all right, doing better than it's her fine. Oh, thankfully, who's, you know, spends a lot of time thinking about this stuff. Yes. How How's your week been, Keith? Thank you, Richard. Well, I had a decent week, actually, up 3.2%. Um, Still having a shit year, but, you know, I'm very highly geared to uh, bond yields and bond yields are finally coming down. I mean, the uh, inflation's coming down. And as we approach interest rate cuts, I expect to recover most of the money. I actually hopefully get out of this trade alive. So, uh, yeah, um, let's see what happens. Um, and we will discuss when we get, I get out of this trade, what on earth I'm going to do next? Because my cyclical approach really hasn't worked. What I you should I was expecting to see was that um, higher interest rates would kill the economy, and that would lead mean oil prices collapsed, and I would be able to buy in when uh, oil prices down on the floor. That's my usual game, but um, it hasn't happened, and oil prices have not collapsed, and there are no bargains to be had. So normally my approach is basically to just sit it, sit it out until I see a, an obvious trade. 
And right now, to me, there are no obvious trades. So it's kind of sitting it out. Yeah. Okay. Okay, that's it. Thank you all for watching. Richard has been dialing in from his mega yacht. So... Um, He's, the glamorous nature of my mega yacht, in inverted commas, is I've been fixing leaks. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, I think what you mean is you've been enhancing the value of your assets. Oh, yes, 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 yes. <laughs> uh, please, can you press like and subscribe to the channel? And it's goodbye from Richard Buita. Well, it's goodbye. It's Keith Jordan. Goodbye. Goodbye. Full disclaimer. The material and information contained in this podcast is for information and entertainment purposes only and should not be relied upon for making a business, legal or any other decision. We may own or have a financial interest in any securities mentioned. Listeners should conduct their own research or consult a professional investment advisor before making any decisions regarding topics mentioned on the show. Whilst we endeavour to ensure that the information presented on the show is correct, we make no representations or warranties of any kind, expressed or implied, with respect to the podcast and website or to any information, products, services or related graphics discussed or presented in the podcast or website. Any reliance you place on such material is strictly at your own risk. You are solely responsible for the investment decisions you make. We will not be responsible for any errors or omissions in the podcast or website, including in articles or postings, for hyperlinks embedded in messages, or for any results obtained from the use of such information. Nor will we be liable for any loss or damage, including consequential damages, if any, caused by a reader's reliance on any information provided by the podcast or website. Please do not listen to the podcast if you do not accept self-responsibility for your actions.